My name is Bruce, and I'm an alcoholic. Hi, Bruce. I'm from Nebraska City. It's a little town of about 8,000. And uh, A in a town of 8,000 is a lot different, believe it or not. And I'm really glad to be here. About, oh, 75 people have asked me in the last three days if I'm nervous. <laughs> and uh, I'm really not all that nervous. If you want to know the truth, the committee's nervous. You know? <laughs> Think about it. They took your money, paid for my plane ticket, my hotel room, my meals. So, so they're the ones that are really wondering if this whole thing's going to work out. <laughs> and uh, it's really, if it, in order, my idea of it working out would be that uh, uh, that somehow between now and the time this ends, is that. We're successful at communicating, and uh, the problem with that is that I I grew up on ranches in western Nebraska, riding horses and listening to Jimi Hendrix. And, uh, so it's possible that we may see things differently. You know? It's like the alcoholic cowboy both of which are not good for communications, who went to the doctor and said, Doctor, uh, my wife and I have been talking, and we've decided that I should be castrated. And the doctor uh, reacted about that same way. He goes, my. And uh, he says, I, I don't know if we want to do that. And he says, no, m my wife and I have talked, and we decided that would be the best thing. So anyway... Uh, uh, he let him sit there for about three hours and kept coming back and checking on him. Pretty soon he said, well, if you guys really think so, come in next Wednesday and we'll have the surgery. And so the next Wednesday, the cowboy went into the hospital and they had the surgery and he woke up in the recovery room and there was another guy in the room there. And, and he said, uh, what are you in here for? And the guy said, uh, circumcision. And the cowboy goes, that's the word I was trying to think of. <laughs> If, if you're either a cowboy or an alcoholic and you don't really know what you're doing, you certainly don't want to ask anybody. And, uh, and that can be a problem, you know. The other thing about communications, I wrote a little thing down here. I got a book, it's called Inevitable Grace. And there was this French writer, his name was Balzac. And he talked about how he listens to people. And I'll just read the little thing to you. It says, Listening to people talking, I could enter into their lives, feel their tattered clothes on my back, walk with my feet in their shoes, their desires, their needs, all pass into my soul. Or my soul passed into theirs, and it was a dream of a man awake. And, and I thought about that. And what that means to me is... His purpose for listening was quite different from what my purpose was always. Uh, I always, because I'm a man, I think, might be the reason, but when I listen to people, I would always evaluate what they said against what I think is right or wrong. And I would go, well, that's right, no, that's wrong, right? I thought that was the purpose of listening. And the purpose of listening is to put yourself into their place and to understand where they're coming from. And, and you're going to hear a lot of things out of me tonight that are about the way life appears to me, the way Alcoholics Anonymous appears to me today. You know, if you hear something you don't agree with, you know, wait 18 months. I, I change my mind about everything every 18 months. <laughs> I mean, I don't agree with it either, you know? So the whole point is, I'm just telling you the way it looks with my eyes coming from where I come from in Alcoholics Anonymous today. And if we're going to be successful for those committee members, you know, you're going to have to forgive me for being different, for thinking different, you know, for maybe not having the same ideas you do, and we're going to have to find some common ground. So I'm asking you for their sake, you know, 
to uh, let's do the best we can. Really, to listen, we have to temporarily surrender our personality, you know. And for me, that's not an easy task. There is uh, one thing I've I've heard a lot everywhere I go in is is uh, people talk about uh, addicts and alcoholics, and I do like to talk about the difference, or what appears to be the difference. Tom O'Sullivan always talked about it, and he would say, hey, if you took a hundred of us and you put us in a room, and every day you gave us a shot of heroin, only every day you increased the amount, at the end of a year, all 100 of us would be addicted. And nobody would argue with that. But if you put a hundred of us in a room, and every day, just a hundred people from a cross-section of life, put them in a room, and every day you gave them a shot of Jack Daniels, only every day you increased the amount. At the end of a year, six of those people would be alcoholic. And all six of them would be absolutely convinced they were one of the other 94. <laughs> and, and just to go on, you know, because I, I know that I'm not an addict because I could, never, I could never use drugs the way I would have to be to be a good addict, I think. And, and just to describe, you know, I, I was a cowboy. I grew up on ranches riding horses. And, and so, but I'd go into town to Alliance, and I went to high school there. They boarded me out. And, and I met them boys at the Catholic school. And I was a Catholic, but I mean, uh, yeah. And uh, <laughs> those boys taught me how to smoke pot, you know. So you try to picture this circle of, of uh, hippies and one cowboy sitting there. And... <laughs> passing this big fat joint around. Now I'm looking at this thing and I'm thinking, how am I going to get my share, you know? And, and I got a good set of lungs. So when a thing would get to me, I would suck as much of that rancid smoke up into my lungs as I absolutely could, you know? And, and you know, my, my lungs would be on fire and my eyes would be watering and I'd be holding my breath until I couldn't stand it anymore. And I'd finally cough and blow snot out of both nostrils. <laughs> Some of you can probably relate. But my head would be spinning. I didn't know if I'd held my breath too long or if it was a pot. Pretty soon, them guys didn't want to share their pot with me anymore. You know? And I had the same kind of experience with hard drugs, you know. I, I was the kind of boy that mama never wanted to have, you know. If you'd offered me a horse tranquilizer, I'd have gone, sure. <laughs> if it's good for the horse, <laughs> you know. Now, I was living in El Cajon, California, and there was two girls that lived several apartments down, and I thought they were kind of cute, you know, and and I'd always hoped something good would happen, but I <clears throat> never had the courage to talk to him or anything. And one day, one of those girls knocked on my door. And, and she knocked, knock, and I come to the door, and there she is, you know, and I'm thinking it's a dream come true. And she goes, we were wondering if you would like to come down and try some angel dust with us. <clears throat> and I said, sure. So, so they took this little joint, you know, and they sprinkled this dust on it. And I'm sitting there thinking, that's awful small for three of us, you know. <laughs> and so they pass it around, and these girls take a tiny little hit, and I suck half that thing up, pass it on, and after twice around, it's gone. I'm thinking, well, now what are we going to do? And first thing you know, I'm sitting there, and I can, my heart's starting to race a little bit, and I'm thinking, well... It's probably the dust. I should be calm. And so I'm sitting there trying to calm down, you know. And, and then, uh, first thing you know, I can kind of, I can hear my heart beating. And usually you can't hear it, you know. And it's, it's banging away. And I'm sitting there and I can kind of hear my blood rushing through. And so I made the mistake of looking down at my shirt. And I could see that my shirt was moving, you know. And... Once I, once I looked at it, I couldn't take my eyes off of it, you know. And, and before you know it, it was getting out into the room and, and getting back into my chest. And, 
I, <laughs> I said, Settle down now. <laughs> I don't know how uh, long all that took. I mean, uh, I don't know how long. Could have been hours or minutes. I have no idea. The next thing I know, when I had a moment of clarity, I was uh, laying back on the couch like this, and there was one girl holding on to each leg, trying to hold me down. And they're going, are you okay? And I said, sure. <laughs> you know? I, so I thought, I better go. And <laughs> bet I impressed the heck out of those girls. What do you think? <laughs> that was our last encounter. <laughs> so basically, the way I look at it, you have to have a modicum of intelligence to be an addict. And I just don't have the ability to moderate, if you know what I mean. So, uh, so why am I an alcoholic? That was something I just could never figure, never really understood. And, you know, I, uh, I realized I was an alcoholic before I ever knew why, which is odd, you know. And uh, a lot of the uh, senior executives in AA talk about alcoholism, and I've listened and the big book talks about it, and, and they, uh, they say Alcoholics Anonymous is a disease, and it affects you in three ways. It affects you physically, mentally, and spiritually. And physically, it talks about in the chapter, We Agnostics, it says if, if when you drink, you can't always control the amount. Okay? And I can understand that. And also, in, in a doctor's opinion, it talks about the phenomenon of craving. And the truth is, once I started drinking, I didn't always know what was going to happen. You know, I, I was in Vallejo, California one time. Our submarine was in the shipyard. And uh, it was a Saturday morning, and I was drinking beer and watching cartoons. <laughs> and uh, I got hungry. And so I thought, well, I'll go down to the Jack in the Box, you know. They got a little drive through restaurant there. and So I went down to the Jack in the Box, and I got up to the little metal box where they take your order, and I fell asleep. <laughs> you laugh now, but... <laughs> the next thing I knew, there was a policeman shaking me by the shoulder, and I looked in the mirror, there was a whole line of cars behind me. And I thought, well, this is not what I intended. It was a few years later, I was uh, in Bellevue, and uh, I uh, was out drinking at this nightclub, and I fell asleep while I was walking. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. I woke up in a trailer house in La Platte, Nebraska. I had never been there before. And when I woke up, I was laying on my side on the bed, and there was a German shepherd laying there. <laughs> Yeah. Now you guys, you know, a lot of thoughts run through my mind. And my problem really wasn't nearly as bad about drinking as it was about waking up, you know? I, So when I drank, the point is, I didn't always know what was going to happen. Sometimes it went quite well, and sometimes it didn't, you know. So that's the physical part, as it appears to me today. Then there's the mental obsession, you know. And the mental obsession I didn't understand either, because it's odd, because I thought of in terms of addiction. But when you're physically addicted to something, you have this craving all the time. You have to go back and service your addiction. But with alcohol, it's alcoholism, it's different. You can drink for periods of time, and then you can quit. And then, and then uh, you can know you better quit. And then you go back and drink. Like the guy in the big book who knows to drink again is probably to die. And then he's at this uh, restaurant or whatever, or a tavern, and decides he'll have a shot of scotch in his milk, which I can't fathom, but... I, <laughs> What I couldn't fathom was 
how could this guy take a drink and not know he's an alcoholic? I couldn't fathom that. But I, do, I can fathom this. It's like, uh, but I can also fathom that now. I've learned since. But, but uh, when I, there was a time, for instance, when I, uh, I, had a, I have a daughter who's 26 now. When she was a year and a half old, she come from a previous marriage. And she was a year and a half, we were living out in Chula Vista, California. And we had apartments with a swimming pool. And, and I wasn't very happy in my life. I didn't really like being in the Navy. I really didn't have a very happy marriage, you know. But I loved being a daddy. And I would take that little girl down to the pool every day after work. And I could take her. She trusted me so much at that point in time. I could take her little arms and wrap them around my neck. And I could dive into that pool at one end and swim underneath the water the whole length of the pool. And she would go under with me and come up on the other end. People used to be amazed she trusted me that much. It was a year and a half later, we were in Vallejo, and I was at a bowling alley, and I know I was drinking, and I was playing with her, and I took her in my hands like that, and I threw her up in the air, and I, my coordination was bad because of my drinking, and she flipped over my thumbs, and she landed straight on her face on the hardwood floor, and it drove her teeth up into her gums. It was the last time I ever picked her up, and I, I remember standing there, and feeling like an animal, feeling despicable. Everyone probably was looking at me. I felt like they were like maybe they are tonight. And, <laughs> and I've always often thought since, you know, this really epitomizes alcoholism. The last person in the world I wanted to hurt was her. Last person in the world. And you always end up hurting the people you don't want to hurt with alcoholism. That's the way it works. You know, but I never knew that. But I knew that it happened because of drinking. I didn't know that I was an alcoholic, but I knew that it happened because of drinking. And I made a decision not to drink. And I made that decision with all the earnestness that I could ever possibly have. You know, it broke my heart what happened. And it was a short time after that. They, they were gone out of my life. And three weeks later, I think, I was sitting there, and I decided to take a drink. And I drank without any defense whatsoever. I just drank. And that happened to me over and over. I would drink with no defense. Now, after I got sober, I thought, how could you ever drink? and not know you're an alcoholic like the guy that takes the scotch and milk. How could you not know? And, I, and we were, Robin, my present wife, we were living in a house and, and uh, I'd been sober four years and things were going pretty well in our lives, you know, as well as they can in four years. And uh, she was in the TV room and she was drinking a glass of Amarato. I never drank Amarato. And she had a crystal glass with a gold ring around it. I never drank anything that pretty in my life. And, and, and I walked into the room, and my eyes just caught that crystal glass, and the light shined through it, and I was mesmerized, baby. I mean, I was locked on. And I told her, I said, let me have a drink of that. And she looks at me with these daggers, you know, and she goes, and then I go, it dawned on me what I'd said, and I said, ah, just kidding. You know? <laughs> and so I go to work and, and I'm welding on this pump on my workbench, you know, like two days later and I got to thinking about that and I thought, oh my gosh. If she would have just handed it to me, I would have took it. That's all it took. And from that day on, I knew that I was not keeping myself away from that first drink. You know? I went through the steps again this year, and one of, the, one of the things that I'm quite aware of is that I am not immune from drinking. You know, I watch people go out and drink with, with uh, longer lengths of sobriety than I have all the time. And I watch people leave AA, you know. So, anyway, I know with the mental obsession, the idea is, is that we don't, we don't solve the problem with the mental obsession. There's only one thing. I've seen people leave AA 
and come back. How many? There's a lot of people here I know that have gone out and drank and come back to AA. And the first thing that I see AA people do when somebody comes back in is go, why would you do that? And, and people always go, well, I mean, I wasn't going to enough meetings, I wasn't doing this. No, that's not the right answer. <laughs> the right answer is that no human power can relieve your alcoholism. And if that mental obsession is going to be removed, God's going to do it. <clears throat> you know? Because I thought for a long time the reason I was sober was because the ritual of AA. The things that I did. Go to the same meetings. You know? Work with others. Do this. I thought that's why I was sober. But I know that's not true. Because I've seen people who probably did it better than I'm doing it now that went out and drank. I've seen that. So it seems to me that God is the only reason that I'm here today. My last drink was January 26th of 1980. And I was... Uh, 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 Robin and I were, were not married yet. She was a hairstylist at these hair salons and and uh, they had they had their Christmas party on January 26th that year. It was a Saturday, and and this particular uh, uh, group of salons, uh, they had a heck of a Christmas party. It really was a lot of fun. I mean, they they knew how to put on the dog, you know. And uh, we were going to go, and so it was Saturday. So I went down to the Purple Shanty to drink a little beer and play a little pool, and, and uh, while she was working. And then at 5, when she got off, I was supposed to pick her up, and we'd get ready and go to the party. But at 5, well, as luck would have it, I, I got a little out of hand. <laughs> and at 5, the manager of the shanty called her from his trailer house and said, Bruce is passed out in my bed, and he's not going to be able to make it to the party. And she said, okay. So she goes without me, and about 7.30, I woke up again, and I thought I should go out and finish up what I started. Now I know he tried to talk me out of it, but I went back out drinking again. And about 2.30 in the morning, I had an old 73 Pino, and, <laughs> and I'm speeding along at 35, I'm sure, and I ran into the back end of a park straight truck. <laughs> and in the meantime, probably the biggest cop in southeast Nebraska was giving this guy in the straight truck a field sobriety test. <laughs> Now, I always thought, if I was that guy, I'd have been very happy about that. <laughs> they said there was a big fight that follows. I don't remember too much of it. I got my face drug over the concrete and worked over pretty good from the armpits down. And they took me into jail. Robin claims that, that uh, they allowed me to call her around 3.30. And I called her on the phone, and we were having a conversation, I guess. And she said she heard of a bunch of obscenity, some crashing. And uh, pretty soon they got on and said, well, uh, we've gone ahead and put him to bed. And uh, I guess I kicked a hole in the wall at the police station. So, so I got arrested while I was in jail. <laughs> yeah. Why no joke? That used to be one of his 20 questions. Have you ever been arrested while you were in jail? <laughs> Have you ever woke up in bed with a circus midget? <laughs> he was funny. But anyway, <clears throat> I woke up the next morning, and believe me, I was hurting, but I'd been beat up before, and, and I had to get a DWI about every year. And uh, so it wasn't nothing new, right? But something was different for me. And, uh, you know, I was like the cat that had sex with the skunk. You know? He didn't get all he wanted, but he got all he could stand.
You guys are rowdy out here in the East. I, I'm impressed. No, really. I mean, I'd, I'd gone just about as far as I was willing to go. The only problem was, well, actually, when I woke up that morning, I knew beyond the shadow of a doubt I was an alcoholic. Now, I'd had a lot of people that had discussed that with me, my mother, and, and uh, uh, but I never really understood what an alcoholic was. I knew I didn't drink all the time, but for some reason that day, I knew that I was an alcoholic. On the downside was I had never known anybody in AA, nobody that went to treatment. I had no idea that there was a solution. So that's kind of a rough spot to be in. And so Robin came and picked me up and, and I went home that day to the apartment. Called my brother, I don't know why. And he came over and sat with me and I know I was a sorry sight. I was crying, and, and uh, Robin tells me, you know, I had an uncle, I got an uncle in Massachusetts who's been in Alcoholics Anonymous, and he hadn't drank for quite a long time. So we got the phone book out, and we looked up Alcoholics Anonymous, and we called, and uh, this lady answers, and I have no idea exactly what I said other than I needed help, and she said, we'll send a couple of guys over. So I sit there and, and uh, waited for the ambulance. <laughs> I thought it'd be a doctor and a psychiatrist or something. A couple guys showed up. And actually, one of the guys runs this taping thing and uh, showed up at my door. And, uh, uh, and they gave me a real 12-step call, you know. And uh, for that, I am grateful. I don't remember too much of it. There was a conversation. I know the one guy had been sober 14 years. And uh, the other one said he'd been sober a year. The guy that was sober 14, now I thought, now there's a liar. You know. <laughs> the guy that was sober a year, I thought, well, you know, he looks like maybe he's only been sober a year. And uh, so they, they talked to me. and and uh, told me there was a meeting that night. And I do know on the way out the door, the one guy turned to me and said, oh, by the way, throw away all your pot and funny looking pills. And I thought, oh, man. I mean, I know quitting drinking is going to be hard. I thought if I could smoke a little pot, you know, maybe I could get through the rough spots. But I was so scared, I did what they told me. And we went to the meeting that night. Yeah, I figured, well, I'd taken a shower when I got that day, and uh, I go to the meeting, and it's January 27th, I'm wearing an old navy pea coat, you know, I got a conical cap pulled down to here so nobody can see me, and I walk into that meeting, and I know that, uh, well, I'd been drinking all night, so, or that night before, and plus I'd been beat up, and, and that stuff was starting to come out of my pores, so I know that, I know that that's offensive. <laughs> I know it is. And I felt offensive, believe me. And so I walk into this meeting, and here's this lady. Her name's Joan. Okay? And Joan is a little older than I am, not, not too much, but she smells like one of my aunts. You know, she's got powder on. And, and so I'm standing there like this, and this lady walks up to me for no apparent reason, puts her arms around me, and gives me a hug. Says, I'm glad to see you. Well, I just went rigid. <laughs> And I thought, what's she hugging me for? Now, the thing about that is, is that is the only thing I remember out of that first meeting. That's it. So I tell the guys I sponsor, you know, it must be important. That's all I remember. So when you see somebody come through the door, for crying out loud, hug them, you know? Or shake their hand or something. I always tell the guys I sponsor, I love you, you know. It's not real popular today. And I was sponsoring this guy, this plumber from Peru, and it was the first phone conversation we'd had, and we were talking, he got done talking. I said, uh, I love you, Russell. And there's this silence on the line. <laughs> Pretty soon he goes, uh, I appreciate that. <laughs> I 
remember the Robin went with me every night for two weeks, and I remember. Uh, I know they had some closed meetings, but they she came with me. I don't think I'd have gone without her for those first two weeks. She was the only person I had in my life that I wanted to go with. I'll tell you, and nobody told her to leave, and I appreciate that. I remember the third meeting we went to. It was at this place called the Columban Fathers. And there was this lady there that was leading the meeting. And there was probably 11 people there. And she goes, tonight the meeting's going to be on sex. Well, Robin and I were not in, a, in shape for that, I'll tell you. We were like... <laughs> and so we were up going to the bathroom hoping they would get by us, you know, before we got there. And then when they finally got around to her, Robin said, I'm with him. And... Uh, <laughs> And uh, th this was the only meeting I never cried at. I think for the first three weeks, I was just too frightened. And uh, and they uh, they called on me, and I said, "Well, my name's Bruce, and I don't know what to say about sex. I like it." You know? I thought, I thought, what's AA about? I just couldn't get it, you know. And, and all the people. We'd get together after the meetings and talk, and you know they was talking about you, how they do. I've always said, I'm like the guy who goes to the football game, and when the players get in the huddle, I think they're talking about me, you know. <laughs> yeah. I thought A was, I didn't know what it was, honestly, I had no idea. But anyway... Then there's the other part. I talked about physical and mental. Then there's spiritual. And I had no idea about that. But it stands to reason anybody who lives the way we do is going to have a spiritual problem. <laughs> or it might be caused by a spiritual problem, but you know there's a connection. On page 52 in the big book, it describes the symptoms of people who have spiritual problems. Now, people who have spiritual problems have these symptoms irregardless of whether they're alcoholic or not. You know? What it says is we're having trouble with personal relationships. Okay? Now, I really didn't know that until after I got sober. You know? I'd been sober going to meetings for a while, and I'm laying in bed one night asleep, and for some reason I woke up. And I opened my eyes and I looked and Robin was standing over me with a clock radio and she was going to bash my head in. <laughs> and I don't even know what was wrong. I mean, I was having trouble with relationships. I didn't know the first thing about them. You know? I'd only ever had one friend at a time and, and it wasn't very long before they, we couldn't stand each other, you know, and then I'd go find another poor sucker. And, uh, and so I, I didn't know. The other thing was that we couldn't control our emotional nature, you know? Now, I've always had a problem with anger. And over the years, in Alcoholics Anonymous, anger has caused me, to, or has, has been contributed to my actions when they were very inappropriate. For instance, I have children. I can remember taking my six-year-old son, grabbing his little arms, and being so angry my face would be red, the blood veins would pop out of my neck, and I'd just be losing it. And the thought would come to me, what the hell is wrong with me? What is wrong with me? He don't deserve that. You know? And, and I could do nothing about my anger. You know? My anger, it ain't like I could get up in the morning and say, I'm going to be slightly depressed till about 10.30. Then, I, then I'm going to go into a mild state of euphoria for the rest of the day. I mean, my emotions visited me when they wanted to. I couldn't control my emotional nature. And I still can't. Any more than I can stay away from drinking. There's something about anger, you know. It, for me, it's power. Because it was probably great for cavemen, you know, if you had to get away from a dinosaur or something. And, and it did get me out of some situations at times that I was petrified in. If I could get angry enough, I could mobilize myself, you know. But the trouble is, most of the time, especially today, it causes great harm in my life. 
when I get angry. And it still embarrasses me. It's, it's the one number one reason I've had to make amends to my children I don't know how many thousand times. I, today when I go to my children, I go, I know my anger was inappropriate. They go, yeah, we know. We know. You know. I mean, I know you're not supposed to do that, but that's a different deal. That's got nothing to do with my anger. My anger is inappropriate. It's not right for you. It's, 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 uh, it's related to fear. Guys are not real perceptive about what's going on inside, you know. Uh, women seem to be a little more spiritually fit or something, I mean, from the get-go. They kind of know what they're feeling. You know, I grew up watching John Wayne movies. It ain't like that guy was not in touch with his feelings, let me tell you. <laughs> you know, John Wayne didn't cry. And my dad was a cowboy, and he didn't cry, you know. And he wasn't afraid that I could ever detect and, and I thought I was a coward all the time, you know. So I don't know. I'd also learned somewhere along the line that women will hurt you. <laughs> I knew that was true. And we were in this marriage, and I was sober and trying my best. And, and you know, I got it was tough. Me and Robin were having a tough time, you know. And... Uh, I'd go to the meetings and I'd talk to people and they'd tell me, you know, you need to wash dishes. And I'd go home and I'd wash dishes, man. And uh, it wasn't getting any better. And, and I'd go and I knew people in A who had good marriages. And, and I remember thinking, you know, you know, I know God would help me if I just knew, if I just knew what to do. You know, how many people in here, raise your hand, you know, how many people in here think you're agnostic? That's about the average. I don't see one hand. <laughs> and the name of that chapter is We Agnostics. What do you make of that? <laughs> What's that mean? How come none of us are agnostics and we got a chapter in the book that says We Agnostics? <laughs> Why don't it say, We used to be agnostic, but we're not anymore? <laughs> Or say, them agnostics. <laughs> I don't know. I finally figured it out. Because I didn't know what an agnostic was. And I, I don't think hardly anybody in this whole world knows what an agnostic is. If you tell a religious person they're agnostic, they're going to get very troublesome to deal with. I mean, and, and an agnostic is not an atheist. All right? It's different from an atheist. It does not mean you're an atheist. It doesn't mean you don't believe. You know? It's about your behavior. For instance, why was I over and over again having the same problem in my marriage, giving up, thinking it was getting better, then it would get worse, then it would get better, then it would get worse, and I kept thinking, I've got to do something spectacular in order to make this work. And I know that I can't. And I know that some of you people can. And I don't know why I can't. It's as if... <laughs> you got a sponsor, kid. <laughs> She's a beaut. <laughs> oh, don't take her out. If I can't keep the floor against that kid, I'm, I'm a loser. I shouldn't even be here. <laughs> now, here's what an agnostic is. I don't know if any of you can relate to this, but alcoholics and al try harder in their lives than anybody I've ever seen. They try so hard they should bleed. I mean, they try hard. They try hard to do the right thing. We don't give up on our relationships easy, man. We try, God dang it. We try, don't we? You know? And if I'm trying to change something in my life, don't I work hard at it? I try. 
It would never occur to me, never, that I could ask God to do it for me, get out of the way, and He would. Never. Until. The way it happened in my marriage was I got to the point where I realized I don't have it. I cannot be a husband. I do not have what it takes. On my best day, I'll never be able to put together enough good actions in order to be a husband. I can't do it. And I thought, God, you just do what you're going to. You do what's supposed to be. I cannot do it. And I went through the steps. You know? And from that day on, Robin and I have grown spiritually together. Because I finally recognized that I can't do it. And I was too agnostic to stop trying. And, and it's not like you're an agnostic or a true believer. It's like we got one foot in everything. You know what I mean? <laughs> hey, I'm a true believer when it comes to my alcoholism today. I don't think about drinking. I know that I'm not immune. But I don't think about drinking. I don't worry about what I have to do to not drink today. That's pretty much been removed from my life. I know that it wasn't always that way, but it is today. I trust God with that part of my life. Today, I trust God with my marriage. When we get in a fight, I don't think it's over. I think, if I could keep my mouth shut for a while, we could talk about this. <laughs> now, now, that's not easy for me to do. When we were early in our relationship, Robin, when I met her, was like 95 pounds dripping wet, you know. And, and you know, I remember one time, we were living in a townhouse, we had a huge argument, and me, what she needs is space. She needs me to let her go, right? And not me, I gotta get to the bottom of it. I gotta solve it. I need a solution. I'm a man, right? So I'm following her up the steps and she goes in the bathroom and slams the door, you know, and I catch the door and I go inside. And yeah, mistake. <laughs> I cornered her. Don't ever corner him, you know. Well, I'm a pretty good-sized guy. She's standing there looking up at me, and she doubles her little fist up, man, and she swings a big old haymaker like that and hits me right under the chin. I mean, it rocks my head back, and I go, whoa! And I'm looking at her, and then she does it again. She goes, wham! And I'm just like in shock, and I go, dang, honey. If you weighed 50 more pounds, you'd have killed me. Then we're both laughing. You know? I can't believe, you know. And the funny thing is, you know, love is not what I thought it was. You know? The world teaches us all kinds of junk that really makes it hard for us to do things. I mean, you know, it tells us, you know, we think love is, you know, romance, lust. You know, I would never admit that, but of course, you know, I fell in lust quite a few times. But, but the idea is, I didn't know what love was. Alcoholics Anonymous has taught me what love is. You know, by serving others. Every few years, my life becomes objectionable to me. Not because, not because it's not good, because I become objectionable to me. Because I start noticing some of the things I do and are really not all that great. And it's not that I wasn't always doing them, it's that all of a sudden it's obvious to me that what I'm doing is very self-centered. And so I get to the point where I become desperate enough. I, I can remember this one time, this guy from California was talking to me on the phone, and I was having trouble at work, had trouble in AA. I mean, I had created quite a controversy, you know, I mean a huge one. And, and I felt like I was doing everything that I could do, you know. And and uh, and I just explained it all to him. And he said, you know, you may have gone as far as your talent will take you. And I thought about that. I thought, I think you're right. <laughs> I mean, I've tried everything I know how to try, and it is not getting better. And he said, maybe you ought to think about the steps again. And so I did. And uh, once again, my life changed a little bit. 
and each time I've done that. And I've, I've just gone, started on the steps again this year. I just completed a fifth step last Wednesday. And, uh, but before I started, you know, I, I thought about this a lot, and I always think about it. When I, when I was getting ready to look at the third step, you know, there's a thing I have the guys do. I said, why don't you make a list of your top ten priorities? And that's always kind of entertaining when they're new in AA. And they'll go, well, there's God, the wife, kids, job, uh, home, family, uh, friends, motorcycle. And I say, okay, okay. So, so I'm looking. And I go, okay, let's see this. You got a job and then family, right? Okay. You got a grandma? Yeah, got a grandma. Okay. Let me tell you something. What if you had a choice? Lose your job or we kill your grandma? That's what they do. They go. I, yeah, really. You know, what if you had to make a choice? Well, I'd lose my job. Okay. How about your friend? Well, I'd lose my job. How about somebody you don't like? Well, I'd lose my job. Right? So what's the message? All spiritual things first. All material things follow. Right? So we all know that. But I don't live that way. You know? But the deal is, in the third step prayer, what's it saying? God, I offer myself to Thee. To build with me, and do with me as Thou wilt. All right? Now, I, I don't know what He wants to build with me, but I guarantee you, if my ego is attached to a bunch of non-spiritual things, I may be in trouble when I say that prayer. Because He may help me out there. <laughs> it's happened before. So I tell Him, don't do that third step prayer unless you understand what the possible consequences are. Right? Because anything your ego is attached to is fair game. So then anyway, I, I gave that some thought and, and I did my fourth step. And some of the things I discovered weren't too pretty for somebody that's sober over 18 years and is supposed to be, you know, uh, setting an example for others. And uh, for instance, you know, I come from Nebraska. We we have a football team, you know, and and I'm uh, I got a nephew that plays, and I love sports, and I'm I'm uh, kind of competitive, you know. And uh, I got a son who's 13. Well, I started my four step, and I'm listing all these guys that annoy me, guys at work, and I'm looking at them, going, "What are they annoying me for?" Well, this guy ain't supporting me, you know in my effort to, to be successful, I guess. Showing a little favoritism over there. This guy here is kind of manipulative, you know. And so I list all these guys, and I go, it all boils down to they're not supporting me for my number one cause, which is to be successful, right? Now, I'm not really there for them. That was one thing that started to come through, is I go, you know, I don't really care about these guys that much. I'm really trying to be successful. Now I get to looking at my dad, and then I'm looking at my son. And I'm going, okay, what's the deal with him? Now, he's 13, and my son is a great little athlete. He is. Everybody in Nebraska City talks about it. They'll tell me, man, he is really something. All sports, anything with a ball, he's really good. Okay? The one thing about him, though, that kind of bothers me, I don't say anything too much, but I know I try to nudge him in that direction, is like he'll play basketball, for instance, He'll be driving for a wide open shot and his buddy will be standing there wide open and he'd rather dish off to his buddy than take the shot. Just see his buddy make it. And he don't care if he wins or loses. He comes home after a loss and he's just the same as if he won. Makes no difference in his life whatsoever. And that has bothered me in the past. And I'm looking at this inventory and I'm going, what's the picture here? And I'm going, you know what... I think the world of my perception is a world of competition where people have to prove themselves, have to get ahead, all that crap. That's what I believe, see? And I believe God's world is a world of love and service. Now let me ask you, who's more in line with God's world, my son or myself? Man, that hit me. And it embarrasses me. I should be setting an example for him. You know? So I know I got some wreckage to clear away there. 
And it's not, I mean, I, I tell you, it's so bad. I mean, we'll be playing basketball out in the parking lot one day, and, and he went by me so fast, I tripped, fell on my face, my hands, scratched my glasses, skinned up my arms, and I got up mad, and he goes, that's enough, I quit. <laughs> and, and it's just embarrassing for me to be the way I am, you know? Some other things I looked is commitment. For instance, I've always claimed to be committed to my marriage, and I always talk great about it. I go, you know, I've been in Nashville and Indiana and Michigan and all over talking about my relationship and how committed I am. But I'm looking, and I'm going, okay, I am committed to AA. You know, I make coffee at the AA meeting. I'm there early. I'm there late. I never miss meetings. I'm focused. I'm looking for newcomers. I'm thinking about what I'm doing. I'm there to be a service. I go to work. And I, I enjoy my job, you know. I take other people's inventories, and I love it. And, and I go there, and I think about what I'm doing, and I got guys that work for me, and I try to serve them. And I get home, and I want to watch TV. And I want to sit there. And I don't want to take the time to talk to my kids for a while. And you know what I saw? Is that I'm not committed to my marriage. What's my real priority, you know? And so I saw that, and I thought, I can't do that. So when I take an inventory today, those are the kind of things I say, and that I see, and they're not the kind of things that I necessarily wanted to admit, you know? Like the work. What it boils down when I do my fourth step is there's going to be two products. One product is my defects of character. The other product is how I may have harmed others, Right? And the defects of character goes like this. When I get to step six, it's going to be, am I willing to have God remove my desire to succeed at work so that I can be of service to others, so I can show people about love and service, even if it means less money or zip for recognition. Now, I have not yet done that seventh step. <laughs> I'm going to be honest with you. I'm not there. I've been praying. You know? I want to be that person. Okay? Though I know when I'm getting close to my defects when I know I don't want to give them up. That's when I'm getting close to something real. You know? And so, so I got a list of those things I've been praying on. The other thing is communications, you know, with Robin. Because like I say, women will hurt you. And... They do communicate differently. And I've been studying the situation. And I come home to Robin, and it used to be like this. I would get home. Like Robin works, you know, part-time at the school. She works for someone who's not a very uh, nice person to work for, probably. And when, when I come home, she'll tell me what this person did, you know. And, and, and so I just can't resist making suggestions, you know. <laughs> And my ideas are not that great, but I go ahead and share them with her because I feel obligated, like I can't stop myself, you know? You don't need that part-time job, right? You know? Or, well, you just got to accept her the way she is. Now, whenever I do that, it just makes her mad. She doesn't like my stupid solutions. And so I listen to her sister talk to her, and she'll be explaining what happened at work, and her sister will be going, Oh, I can't believe she did that to you. I don't believe it. Oh, I'll bet that was hard. You know? And I'm thinking, what's with that? <laughs> I mean, if you do that to me, I'll be homicidal, man. <laughs> I want to go kill something. You know, I mean, you got to do like my old sponsor used to do, John. He'd go, her life ain't none of your damn business. Now, that helps me. But she doesn't need that. So I'm looking at this and I'm going, why can't I do that? Now, I don't fully understand it, but there's something I'm not willing to give up to do that. I don't know if it's macho or exactly what it is. I've been looking at it a long time, but I don't want to communicate that way. And I know I'm going to have to. I'm going to have to communicate like a woman. <laughs> I 
if I want, if I want to have a good relationship, and I do, believe me. So I don't know exactly what I got to give up, but I know it's something. So this four steps have been entertained my sponsor pretty good when I did my fifth. And Okay, I got a couple things left and I'll get out of here because I know we're up against it. First of all, I want to tell you, like I'm like a father, I'm pretty incompetent. And A has a way of, you know, the way God helps you is like it seems like I end up doing the, the right thing for the wrong reason. I come out smelling like a rose and I can't figure out how it happens, really. I look afterwards and I go, wow. And people think I was brilliant. And... Like, for instance, my daughter, Lacey. Now, she's a, she's a great kid. She really is. And she's 15 today. And she was, she was 10 years old at home. And she came up to me one day and she goes, Dad, I'd like to get a job. And I go, well, there's not a lot of jobs out there for 10-year-olds, you know. I said, I don't know what you'd do unless you start a business or something. Now, now I have been impressed out here since I've been here. There are a lot of entrepreneurs entrepreneurial people who have a lot of courage about that. But I mentioned, I said, unless you do that, I'm thinking lemonade stand, you know. And she's going, what would I do? And I said, I don't know, it'd have to be something you'd like. And she goes, I like to read. And I go, well, I don't know what you could do with that, you know, unless you sell books or something. She goes, well, I could sell books. And I go, no, nah, I don't think so. Why not? And I go, well, you know, if you was going to sell them, you'd have to be able to get them at wholesale. And she goes, how would you do that? And I'm, I'm going, boy, I wish I'd have kept my mouth shut, you know? <laughs> and I'm going, at least I don't know, unless you could get permission from a publishing company or something, I mean. And so I'm thinking, man. So first thing you know, she's in writing a letter. You know, well, she gets this book, Nancy Drew book, and it's got the address of Putnam Publishing Company in the back in New York, and she's going to write him a letter. First thing you know, Robin comes in and goes, what do you got her doing? And I said, I, I don't know, man. I wish. I wish I'd just shut up sometimes, you know. And so, so she writes him a letter and she says, you know, I'm Lacey Tolling and I'm 10 years old and live in Nebraska City and I want to start my own business selling books. But I'd have to be able to get them at wholesale so I could sell them at a good price. So... So she shoots this letter off in the mail, and I'm thinking, how am I going to explain this to her? Because I know somebody in New York don't want to take the time to help some 10-year-old kid, you know. Three weeks later, she gets this thing back. She's got a poster with all these colored markers and all these free books. And this lady that's their inside director of sales goes, hey, we're really impressed somebody your age wants to start their own business. We'd love to have you as a wholesale customer. <laughs> so... So I'm thinking, well, I better get involved here. <laughs> so I called up the guy that owns the bank, you know, and I go, well, you know, she needs about 40 bucks startup capital, and I could give it to her, but it'd probably be better if she borrowed it. So, so he says, well, send her down, and he loans her $40 and charges her, I don't know what interest rate, you know, through September that year. And, let her open up a checking account for no charge, which you won't do for me. <laughs> and uh, she went down and bought her some business cards. They said, Lacey's Books and Gifts, and in parentheses underneath it goes, books are a kid's best friend. She starts selling books to her friends, right? Pretty soon she runs out of friends. <laughs> so I'm, I'm, I'm trying to get her to make cold calls, and she don't want to do that. And, so we're talking about what kind of kid would want to do that anyway, somebody really aggressive. So she hired a couple sales associates, you know. <laughs> so she's selling books and she's, she's uh, you know, she's paying off her debts and buying clothes and having a pretty good time. And she retired when school started. <laughs> and they had her in the newspaper and in the company magazine, you know what I mean? And everybody's coming to me, hey, that was great, how'd you get her to do that? And I go, I don't know, really. I don't know. I don't know. It's funny, ain't it? So I don't know, God, you know, does things for us. You know, Robin's dad, he lived out here in uh, Washington, D.C., and he was a security police at the Senate building, and 
he was an Archie Bunker type guy, you know, kind of prejudiced and 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 he was he drank a lot and was kind of keep everything you know in the family and and uh, uh, he was 66 and and he had a massive stroke and uh, do you hear something? Oh well, it's probably my fall feelings or something. Anyway, he had a massive stroke. And, and he was just pretty much uh, 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 devastated by this stroke. He couldn't hardly take care of himself. He was in a wheelchair. He really couldn't do anything. He could talk. That was about it. And uh, their house out here in uh, uh, Brandywine wasn't suitable, you know, for him to live in. And Robin kept coming out and spending time with him. And, and so, you know, I'm wanting Robin at home. And, uh, and so I'm going, hey, Robin, you know, we got 1,400 square foot of basement we're not doing nothing with. I'll build a wheelchair apartment if you want to bring him out. Okay, now she had a rough time growing up. And uh, and so we built this apartment and brought him out there and him and her mom. And it was a hard thing. It was really hard. They, it was hard for her mom. It was hard for the family. I mean, the whole family took on a lot. And there was many times I thought, what the heck have I done? I mean, th did I destroy my whole family? You know? And I was at an AA meeting, and it just came to me. I know nobody said it, but it came to me. This is really what AA teaches us, you know, is, you know, you can't keep it unless you give it away. And we were giving away the most precious thing we had, you know. And, and her dad was in pain all the time. It was like his brain was telling him he was feeling pain. There was no particular reason for it. And I'd go down and give him showers all the time. And I'd have to pray before I'd go down there because I didn't want to get angry at him, you know. And I'd hold him in my arms and I'd bathe him. And, and something happened to him, you know, like he had been silent. They had never met a lot of his family. And, and during that last year and a half that he lived, he unburdened himself to me. It's like he had no defenses. And he told me everything. He told me about growing up in Chicago and his alcoholic father who sexually abused him. And, and he, he, just, he just laid it all out. And it was as if he had to do this, you know. And it got down to the point where he was getting ready to die and he was living in the house. And, and I remember I was out uh, mowing one day and, and uh, they had to give him a morphine suppository, you know. And he was in so much pain they couldn't even roll him over. And I went in and I said, Dave, if you want, I'll hold you in my arms while I do this. And he said, all right. And I said, you know, I don't smell too good. And he goes, that's okay. And so I'm holding him in my arms like like the last two days, and he's got his head on my shoulder, and he goes, you don't smell too good, do you? <laughs> and, and, you know, his last day that he could talk, he asked me to come in and hold his hand. I sat in the room and held his hand, felt stupid, you know. And uh, my kids would cycle in and hold his hand, and then after he died, they'd come in and hold his hand, you know. And... You know, I thought I did it for my wife, you know, but I was the one that was affected. You know, I learned about human dignity. And I learned that someday you need help, right? And there's nothing wrong with needing help, you know? I came away from that a different person, you know? I'm going to tell you what, it has changed my life. Being here, something I could have never predicted. Now, it is a privilege for me to be here. And I love you guys. Thanks.